1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to take a little time to just look at what God is doing here and among us and what God is willing to do. Speaking of God doing things, Mike Payne's here. We're going to get to see him this morning. Mike, raise your hand, Mike. Just he's the one that's 21. Good. And he's single. He's available. Been down in Mexico for how long? Two months, and he hasn't found the senorita yet. <laughs> Not none that pass the cold standard of uh, acceptance. Mike's working with one of our missionaries, Bob Walker, down in Tijuana. Great things they're doing. He's got to travel and be a part of preaching in other cities and the church there. What a great thing. He's actually, his actual job is teaching. What do you teach? What grade? Fifth grade. Are you teach in English. Mrs. Bailey. Should he be teaching English? <laughs> he did it. He passed your classes. <laughs> you older, Mike. <laughs> Isn't that great? People who struggle with English are paid to go overseas and teach English. Isn't that something? That is a sad Hey, look. There's nothing. You can do it. Come on. Come on. Look at Mike Payne. You can do it. Church is crowded on Sunday morning. There's not enough room. Some of you go overseas and be missionaries and preach the gospel. Anyway, wherever God leads you, that's a good thing. I hope God leads you to make money and stay in Wilmore. Anyway, look, look here at 1 Samuel chapter 1. Let's stand for a moment. We'll read a couple of verses together. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Story is of a good man. And he had two wives, which is his first mistake. But in those days, they let that thing go. One of them had children, one of them could not. And the one who did have children made fun of and provoked the one who couldn't. It's a good family. And they're on their annual trip. The people worshiped regionally, but there are several feasts a year where they go into Jerusalem and meet there. And uh, that's what we're reading here. That's one of those times they come to Jerusalem, everybody gathered, and it was their yearly thing. So if you look at uh, verse 4, and when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Benaiah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. It's just a time of giving and caring and doing nice things for people. But to Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, gave her a lot more, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so, year by year, she went up to the house of the Lord. So she provoked her. Therefore, it's always you don't want more than one wife, because they ain't going to get along. Amen. All right. Just read the stories. Look at Jacob. He had four. It was not a pretty sight. But uh, anyway. So verse 7, as he did so year by year, she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, the dumbest question a man could ever ask his wife. That's in the original Hebrew. <laughs> then said Elkanah, her husband, to her Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee? than ten sons. <laughs> you single guys, you young men, take note. She did not answer the question. <laughs> That's a good moment. There were all kinds of things going through her head right then she could have said. <laughs> but what did Hannah do? Good girl, verse 9. So Hannah rose up after they'd eaten in Shiloh and after they had drawn. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post in the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass that she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. He thought she was drunk. We'll finish the story. And he said, you need to stop your drinking. He was so unfamiliar with praying people that he thought somebody's mouth moved when they weren't speaking out loud was drunk. Sad day. When we're surprised people in the church are praying. And I want to talk tonight, tonight a little bit more about prayer. Father, speak to our hearts. And, uh, 
We've got a building full several times a week. A lot of people come this morning, many visitors in church. People saved this weekend. Lord, I'm concerned that the churches of America are full of people who don't pray. And I ask you, Lord, to begin working on our hearts. We've spoken to prayer recently, again tonight. Deal with our hearts about prayerlessness, the power of the Holy Spirit that we are missing is brought through times of prayer. May we be people of prayer. Would you nurture in us a spirit that draws us to our prayer closets? When we're tired, may we be refreshed through prayer rather than recreation and rest. Help us, please, tonight to draw a little bit more into that life of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open there just for a moment. Not tonight. And not uh, nothing spectacular tonight, but I, I want to... I want to throw rocks at your, at your glass window of protection between you and your prayer life. You've heard it just in way of review. Paul said to Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all, 1 Timothy 2.1, this young preacher, the very first thing he was to teach his church was to teach the men to what? Pray. Exhort therefore that first of all, Prayer and intercession and giving of thanks. Eight verses, the first eight verses, 1 Timothy chapter 2, are saying we've got to teach our men to pray. Amen. That's the first thing. By the way, the second thing, and first not the sermon tonight, the longer we're there, the second thing he said you need to teach the church, 1 Timothy 2 9, is to teach the woman to dress modestly. And, uh, you know, they don't teach that in Bible college. It, the first two things you teach people when you start a church is to teach the men to pray and the women to dress right. That just isn't said much in Bible colleges. But since we're going to be Bible believers, we're going to say it here. Amen. I don't care if it's summertime in October. <laughs> you know, unless you're for sale, don't advertise. Cloak yourself. The woman's clothing ought to cloak her, to keep her modest. And uh, the, the amount of flesh being shown is beyond inappropriate in America. And we've got to learn modest apparel. We've got to learn to dress not only feminine. Three, just a thought tonight, since we're on the since you asked. <laughs> Three principles of dress in the Bible. There is man and woman dress, male and female in Deuteronomy. Right. So our dress should be should match our gender. And believe it or not, you are a gender. Right. Yeah. Right. No one, no one is both, and right. no one is neither. That's right. Right. Yeah. And no one can change it. Right. Come on. Because you are what God made you. Right. Your choice. So, so first of all, when he talks about dress, it is either male or female dress. Make sure your dress matches your gender. Secondly, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 7, it says the dress should not be that of a harlot. Should dress, a lady should dress like she's for sale. So what does that mean? Just ask the husband. How do we inappropriate, how do, how do immoral women dress? Figure it out. And there are some things that are typical of a woman that's for sale, wants to advertise her body. Those things should not be a part of a woman's attire. Yes. Yes. So not masculine for the woman and not feminine for the male. And, and guys, you guys, you boys, you boys. <laughs> Find some men. Let me talk to you guys under 20. Find some men. Look around the room. There's a bunch of here. Find some men and act like them. Right. Dress like them. Yeah. I've never met a man with a toe ring. Look like a man. Amen. There's a bunch of them here. Dress masculine. 
masculine, sit masculine, stand masculine, wear clothes masculine. Amen. Right. Show thyself a man. It's a Bible verse. Anyway, back to the ladies. So, male or female dress, not like here for sale. And in 1 Timothy, the word is modest. A woman should dress in modest apparel. And the word just means to cloak her figure. There's nothing in the world more beautiful than a woman's body. Just being candid here. You, you, and by the way, you may not teach this to your daughters, but since you're since you're afraid to, I'm not. <laughs> nothing prettier than a girl. Right. Nothing in all the world. I mean, the girls who are insecure and think they're ugly are prettier. Right. And so God says that body belongs to your husband. One day when you get married, you cloak that, you guard that thing because that is the most cherished, yeah. sacred thing in the world. Right. And it is not to be on display. Right, right, right. as if it's for sale because you're a very, very precious possession and so it should be uh, modest, it should not look like it's for sale, it should not be masculine, you know, those are basic things and I have no idea what that has to do with prayer <laughs> but it is the second thing a preacher is supposed to teach his church first thing is supposed to teach the men to pray and you know what, neither one of those are very easy <laughs> You can listen to Christian radio the rest of your life and, and never hear a sermon on the second. And rarely hear a sermon on the first. But tonight I want to talk about the first. Aren't you gals good? You can relax. He's done with that. But ladies ought to pray too. We're looking tonight at this dear lady, Hannah. In verse 9 of chapter 1, Hannah rose up after they'd eaten in Shiloh and after they'd drawn. And Eli sat at the seat by a post in the temple of the Lord. She was in bitterness of soul. This poor girl's heart was just broken. And this is not, by the way, she's not 19 and newlywed. This has been going on year after year after year after year. And she goes down to the temple in, in uh, verse 10. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept sore. And she made a vow to God. said, if you'll give me a boy, I'll give him back to you. He'll be a preacher. He'll be a Lord. <coughs> For his entire life. I give God you give to me, I will not keep him. I promise you. Eli, in verse 14, said, How long will thou be drunken? What a sad thing he didn't think she was pregnant. And he answered in verse 15, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful, sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink. Amen. For ladies that don't drink booze, all right? But have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial. It let's just make this clear. When you think, when he thought she was drinking liquor, she associated that with being a daughter of the devil. Right. Yeah. So when we start trying to justify booze, let's make it clear. According to God's people, that's a satanic thing. Right. Booze is wrong. Yeah. Right. 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 Booze is wrong. I hate yeah. liquor. I'm against liquor. Yeah. Right. I don't, unless it's NyQuil or cough medicine. Banaka or I don't know what else has booze, has liquor in it. I'm an anti-booze. Verse 17, that Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant me thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Let me give you just several observations. We're going to move on to another story. First of all, she did not get her prayers answered right away. <clears throat> she, prayed, she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed. Second of all, she fasted. This thing was eating her up. And her husband said, look, you need to eat. She says, I can't eat. I'm a broken heart and sorrowful soul. And, and uh, he talked her into it. And she did end up eating in the story there. But her heart was breaking. And she prayed. And she fasted. And she longed for God to answer her prayer. And, and sadly, we don't see her husband praying in the story. I'd like to, to say he got with her and said, let's take time every night. We'll take 20 minutes on our knees just pray for God to answer his prayer. I don't see that. He may have. But God didn't point it out if he did. This is a lady who all on her own went to God, brokenhearted with a need beyond any other earthly thing, more than life she wanted God to answer this prayer, and broken and weeping, and she wept sore. She cried until she hurt. The, the preacher thought she was drunk for her out at the altar or sitting in a seat mumbling and, and begging and pleading with God and weeping for God to answer her prayer. And God did answer her prayer. So first of all, 
might just say, God will hear your prayers. But he may not hear them today. Or he may not answer today. God will hear your prayers, but it may be over a broken heart. It may be, it may be days or weeks or months or years of prayer before that prayer is answered. Remember the Apostle Paul, he prayed for th three different times for God to heal him. And, and after the third time, God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. But, but he prayed and prayed and prayed. And when God made it clear you can stop praying, he stopped. I think you should keep praying until God says you don't need to pray anymore. Right. When we started our church, I wanted the Wildemar School as a place to meet. And it was the only, if you, you can't even imagine, some of you that are newcomers, but... But uh, Lake Elson had 10,000 people, Wildemar had 1,000 people, and Murrieta had 1,000 people. There are 1,000 people in Wildemar, 1,000 in Murrieta. The only building in Wildemar was the post office, which is now is the little taco shop. And across the street to Wildemar School, that's the only buildings in Wildemar. And they didn't want to rent it to us, and I was fasting and praying. And I knew when the board meeting was going on, they were going to talk about my, um, my assault on them. And it's a long story, but anyway, um, I wrote up, I found their board, school board policies, and, and their school board policy says our buildings are available for uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, senior citizens, and other charitable organizations, blah, blah, blah. And they told me that they didn't use their buildings for, school, for churches. And I said, your own school board policies say you can, and you have to keep your board policies. I kind of was a little pushy, and um, but during their meeting, I've been fasting, and uh, the meeting was from this time to whenever they stopped, and, and honestly, it was just like God said, it's okay, and I, he, I knew he answered my prayer, and the first thing I did was went and ate. <laughs> it's logical, right? <laughs> I've been fasting 30 minutes or something. And, uh, <laughs> And I went and ate, and then I went, and the meeting was over and found out they gave us, they said, you can use it, we'll give you permission. For, well, they said, we'll give you, sit in writing, I wish I'd have saved the note to put in our book we're putting together. We'll give you six weeks to the Wildemar School to establish a congregation and find a building. That's just a crazy thing. But in six weeks, we had a congregation and we had a building. And God took care of us. Amen. Now, we need to pray. Our first revival meeting, had Dennis Coral, and uh, it was a started on a Wednesday, and it went through to the second Sunday. Every morning uh, and evening, we had soul winning, preaching every evening. It was crazy. I did the 12 days. We were so tired. And Dennis Coral is a sick man. We did, you know, we'd be soul winning twice during the day, soul winning classes, preaching forever. I mean, forever. He'd run invitations longer than most men preach. <laughs> That's why you don't see him here very often. <laughs> the guy's an animal. If you were in the in Brett Beals session in the, during the couples conference, you really need to get a copy of that recording. That brings back memories, hysterical memories. But but um, past tense, and, and I don't talk about these things a lot. But our church was maybe running a hundred. I fasted seven of those 12 days. We had 150 converts baptized in 12 days. It was unbelievable. It was the most exciting two weeks. And when he left, we were so glad. <laughs> we were so tired. <laughs> but many people were saved and became members and and it, look, Go to God for what you want. It's all right to pray and to pray and to pray and to pray. And it's all right to add fasting and fasting and fasting. God's a great God. God's a big God. You're not going to intimidate God with your prayer life. You're not going to bother God because you pray too long. You're not going to, you know, you're, you're not going to interrupt the business of heaven because you fasted. God pays attention for whatever reason to the broken heart. Amen. God does listen to the prayers of his people. And the fact is a child, look, there's children all over. What makes her different than any other lady that wanted a child? Because this one was going to have a baby. Right. Let me just say in, in the years we've been here, 
I, I, I could start mentioning, but I'm all, I almost did it, but I'm not, was not, I determined not to do it, but the number of babies we've had in this church given an answer to prayer. And time after time after time, we have met together with couples, anointed them with oil and prayed. Others, we just prayed together. Some, I just made a simple statement, we will pray. Most recently, I'm going to say two years ago, a couple was not able to have children came and the first time I talked to them, was I know she don't have children, I started crying, started to cry, just like that. I said, we will begin to pray. They've got two today. We have a prayer answer. I wonder, would you promise God that child will be raised like he wants? Would you promise God that child will be raised, taught the way he should be taught, in, or, or her she should be taught, in church, in Sunday school, in a godly environment for their, their Christian education? Would you give that child to God, and would you fast and pray and seek the mercy and help of heaven? But we've got married people we pray God to give us children, who are those, those kids are now married. We've got them that are in the church nursery today. The fact is God answers prayer. Yeah. You know what's funny? And again, you, you know, we've got so many kids in Bible college, and I can say this because most of them are gone. Let me say something to you high school guys that are going to go to Bible college, maybe be in the ministry today. Do not be afraid to put God on the spot. When the book of James says, if you have a request or you're sick, uh, the, it says, call for the elders of the church, anoint, and, the, and, and let them anoint the person with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Do you know how many Baptists are scared to death of that verse? You sit in my office right behind my desk on the bookshelf is a black crystal bottle full of olive oil. I have no idea how many wonderful things we've seen happen. You say, what's the oil got to do with it? I have it's called faith, brother. <laughs> what is faith? Reading the Bible and believing it. Right. I don't know. What, it could be, you know, pen's oil. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's 1030 or 530. <laughs> I've had men in this room gather together with me in someone's home or some other situation where somebody had a tragic situation. And we've knelt together and prayed and laid hands on the sick. And I'm telling you, God is still alive. things that we asked our, when you were a kid, did you ever do a wish list for Christmas? You know what a wish book is? Anybody know what a wish book is? Sears put those out. And it was only a book to promote covetousness in children. <laughs> it was a whole, I mean like a hundred pages or something. And it was just kids as toys and fun things. Man, I'd go through that book and I'd circle all the things I want. You know, I don't know if I ever got one I'm not saying God always gives us what we want, but I'm saying you ought to always pray for what you want. Amen. The Apostle Paul said of Trophus, he said, I left Trophus in my lead him sick. Paul could heal Trophus. I don't know why, because God had a plan that required sickness. Paul's own health was to be healed because God had a plan. But over and over and over we read of healing. And then in James he says that God heals the sick and he raises them up and he forgives their sin. If for some reason it's been associated with that, don't be afraid to pray. Don't be afraid to fast. Look, we need to re relive and rebirth prayer in our lives. Look at Job chapter 1. Turn over just a few pages to the book of Job. If you get to Psalms, you went a book too far. Job chapter 1. We've got a praying lady in 1 Samuel chapter 1. We've got a praying man in Job chapter 1. We've got a dad so concerned about his adult children, not little children. By the way, if you are falling apart with your two-year-old, you don't even want to see the teens. And if your teens are killing you, wait till they're married. 
But you, you want to be able to go, you know, this is, this is chowdering. Little babies, absolutely darling, adorable, all that. Can't even tell one from another. They're just wrinkled little chunks of kid. <laughs> Once they get up where they can say daddy and, and hug you, then they're okay. But uh, these little babies, they, they grow up. You know, it's, it's our job to train them and discipline them and nurture them and, and get them to surrender to the authorities in their life and mold and shape their lives. They get up to the, I mean, third, fourth, sixth, seventh grade. They ought to be a pleasure. But it will only be done through a unified mom and dad and through devotion to this book. Amen. There's no perfect parents. It will not be done through perfect parents. It will be done through parents who stick together and say, we're in this to the end. Yes. If it kills us or kills them. But mom and dad are on the same page, and kids are going to get on the same page. And get those kids up. And by the way, they get up 16, 17, 18. There's a point when they're out of your reach. You may be able to hit them, but you shouldn't. And they're going to have to make some decisions. At that point, they're on their own. I, you know, I, they walk out the door. And, and I'm not saying you've you got to decide when you do that, but I was talking to Brother Beal about it. Brother Beal said, hey, they went to college, it's their problem. I raised them this long. Now they got to decide if they want to be stupid. <laughs> but they start making these decisions, and, and, and boy, you watch your kids raising kids. And man, talk about scary. It's our job to raise these kids and to pray. Look at Job chapter 1. There's a man in the land of us, not Oz. This is no yellow brick road here. A man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. They were born to him seven sons and three daughters. And it goes through all of his wealth and all that he had. And his sons, in verse 4, went to feast and feasted in their houses. So these are all adult children. They had their own homes. And they sent and called for their sisters to eat and drink with them. And so they were busy in their partying and their dinners and all these things. But look at verse 5. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. Thus, look at this last phrase again, thus did Job continually, continually. Job was a man who prayed non-stop for his children. Hey. Adult children. Children that he might, maybe they've done something wrong. They're, they've got their, their world, they've got their life, and I'm not sure how they're doing. But he didn't quit going to God on behalf of them. Don't abandon your children before the throne of grace. Hey. And no matter where your children go, no matter what they do, you make sure that you and God and your children are always there. Never lose hope for your children. Right. God's not dead. Amen. God's not dead. God loves you. God loves your children. And, and I believe a praying mom and dad and a loving God will take care of any distance a child goes. And they may venture on some roads you wish they wouldn't go on. They may go some places you wish they wouldn't go. But out of this, don't be done with your kids. Right. Don't be done with those kids. You pray for them. You love them. You go to heaven praying for those kids yeah. because we've got a God who hears and answers prayer. Job was a righteous man. Job was a perfect and upright man. And yet Job knew no matter how good a dad I am, I've got to have God. Let me say something. We're not perfect and upright like Job. None of us men. We better have God working in our lives and in our children's lives. A dad who thinks he can raise his children and discipline his children and guide and direct his children without prayer is a crazy dad. Well, we need God. I need him and you need him. We all need him desperately. We have a praying lady who prayed for years. We have a praying man who prayed continually, never stopping, never stopping to pray. Look over to Matthew chapter 15. We have to hurry here. Matthew chapter 15. In these stories, each one approaches prayer in a different angle. Matthew chapter 15. We have a lady with a personal need in, in 1 Samuel 1. You're looking for Matthew 15. Hannah wanted a baby. And she would not let up. She would bother God and bother God and bother God. Job, he was concerned about something that might have happened. Hannah had a real need. Job had a, I don't know, but I know this. I'm going to beg God and I'm going to 
bombard the throne of heaven on behalf of my children. I want my children to be okay with God. I want my children to love God. And by the way, I think Job was interceding, saying, God, forgive my kids. Man. I don't know about you, but I pray for our country. I, 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 probably many times a day, I pray, God, have mercy. We don't deserve anything. Right. America's such a mess. Right. Our churches are a mess. Have mercy. I want our country. I love our country. I love what America has been to the world. And as much as the devil would want us slandered and ridiculed and mocked and hated, I'll tell you what, we've sure loved a lot of people. Right. Nobody in France or Belgium or the Philippines hated America when World War II ended. Amen. They would have given their lives for the soldiers that yeah. gave their lives. Yeah. Right. You, visit, you visit the American cemeteries in the Philippines and in Belgium. I've been to those two. I know there's others, but I've been to those two. And um, at the Battle of the Bulge, right outside there where the American cemeteries, that is the most beautiful manicured cemetery you ever see anywhere. And there are still a group of young men, 30s to 40s, who on their days off, there's a name for them, I don't know what it is, but I met one of them, he was with us, and they still go out on their days off looking for shallow graves to find the bodies of American soldiers from World War II. Yeah. And occasionally they find another one. They very carefully dig up the remains through dog tags or whatever they find out. Because the, the situation was so, so terrible in those days, some would die and a, 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 you know, one of the men that was on his, in his group, platoon, whatever there, you know, I, one of my friends dies next to me. This was a bayonet or shovel. They dig a shallow grave and put that man in his body in the grave and bury it so it wouldn't be desecrated or drug off. And, and even there, it'd never be found. But still in Belgium, they go around looking for these and they dig them up, find out who they are. And if they can find relatives in America, they ship them to America. And if they can't find relatives in America, they have the most beautiful cemetery there in Belgium where they have a formal burial. And he said, still to this day, if we are burying an American soldier from World War II, he said hundreds and hundreds will show up from their city in honor of an American that they never knew. Good. And they got more respect for our military than our president. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. They, they understand. There's a love and a loyalty. What an incredible thing. But, but we've got a lady here who wanted something for herself. Then we've got a man who prayed for some. Maybe his children had done wrong, like we ought to be praying for mercy on our country. Uh, I, I don't want our country to get what it deserves. I want our country to get what God in his mercy would be willing to give us. And uh, so I've got adult children, and, and you maybe got adult grandchildren, and go to God and say, God, have mercy on them, and help them, and God, overlook their foolishness, and God, help them through this dark hour of their life, and give them grace. That's, that's dad praying for his children. Then Matthew chapter 15, I love this. This is a great story. If you look down toward the end of the chapter, in verse, uh, if you look at verse 26, I'm mean, sorry, verse 21, Matthew 15, 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now he's leaving Israel over in an area that's not just strict Jewish. And behold, there was a woman of Canaan. Uh, this lady was not a Jewish lady of the coast and cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So here we've got a broken-hearted mom with a demon-possessed daughter. And I mean, she was junior high and blonde. And uh, no, I'm joking, girls. I love you. You're awesome. Uh, God has great plans for you. And uh, this, she's begging. Now look at verse 22 to 23. But he answered her not a word. Here's a lady prayed, and God ignored her. Just ignore her. You ever feel like God's ignoring your prayers? Look at this girl. And she was not going to give up. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. For she cried after us. This gal was following them as they went through the area. Please, please save my daughter. Please save my daughter. And she bugged him and bugged him and bugged him. And he just ignored her. And the disciples said, Lord, get rid of her. That's what you call a lady with a burden. Now in verse 24, but he answered and said to her, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He said, girl, you're not a Jew, and I'm only here to help the Jews right now. 
gospel would go to the Gentiles later, right now. In verse 25, she got what she wanted. She got it talking. And she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he said, it's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. He called her a name. It was interesting. I got a list in my Bible I've been creating lately of times <coughs> God calls people names. You know, we're such a soft, sissy generation of yeah, preachers. Right, come on. We all need a safe zone. Right. Yeah. Let me say something. This room is not a safe zone. <laughs> Want to put a sign in the door wearing your steel-toed shoes and your bully, your flak jacket. <laughs> put on your helmet. The safe zone. A bunch of crazies in this world. Man. Jesus said, it's not me to give the children's bread and cast it to dogs. That's right. She said, verse 27, truth, Lord, the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their own masters, from their master's table. Yeah. Jesus said, I'm done. <laughs> I've ignored you. I've mocked you. I've called you names. And you know what you mean. I give up. I'm not going to beat this girl. Whatever you want, you can have it. That's something. I love this story because this lady wanted her child healed. There's just no question it was going to happen. And Jesus finally surrendered. We've got a praying lady praying for a child for herself. We've got a praying man praying for his adult children continually. We've got a lady who would not let up until God heard her prayers. We need praying men and praying women. We need people to go before the throne of God to seek God's help and to, to implore the power of heaven in our lives. Prayer in most of our lives has become a bunch of hollow words tossed out. And dear God, bless the food. Amen. Amen. You know, the dad kneels with his children at bedtime because it's the right thing to do with all their heads bowed in the bed or wherever they pray together. And the dad says, dear God, thank you for the food. Hollow, empathy, meaning. But there is a God in heaven. We'll have time to turn there. The Apostle Paul said, pray for me that I would be bold. It would be good if everybody in the room knew when a soul winning time was going on and you prayed for the soul winners that they would be bold. This big day that's coming up, it would be good if we take time to pray daily for bus workers and bus captains and pray for a great day to go to go well. We've got three extra buses we could run on the big day. We have to be praying now. Let, let's just be honest. If we had a bus driver, a bus captain, and three or four bus workers, we could have another bus running all the time. Amen. We got three of them. I think I'm going to pray. Jesus said, pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. I think it would be good if we sat back in our bedrooms, living rooms, kitchen, wherever we read our Bible and pray and say, God, we need more Sunday school teachers. Yeah. God, we need more people out on Thursday night soul winning. God, we need more people Saturday morning out soul winning. God, we need more people in the jails and the rest of them. They talked to John Lewis. They talked to, to Brian Patton. We could have more services in more places if we had more workers. The limit to our work in the rest homes of this area is the limit to the number of people who will give up their Saturday or Sunday or a weekday and go into those homes and bring church to those people. The limit to the number of people that will ride in our buses, let me just be honest, bus workers, most of you could have doubled your attendance today and still fit on your bus. Come on. Now we prayed over a bus ride. And we prayed for more work. We might say, you know, I, I put in the hours I can't put in any, in any more hours. All right, then pray for more workers. Amen. Let's get another two or three workers on each bus route. I think we ought to pray. The Apostle Paul asked for prayer. I think of Timothy, this great young man. And Paul attributed Timothy's greatness to his, the faith of his mother and his grandmother. We need godly praying moments. Godly praying grandmothers. Like, there's just no way we can overrate prayer. Prayer gets people to the throne of God. Prayer connects you to the grace and mercy of heaven. Prayer 
brings things into your life that would not be there if you didn't pray. There are things God will do for you. And I, and I know God does things in his sovereignty that just because he's God. Let's just be honest. I could have quit a long time ago. The only reason you're here tonight, the only reason I'm here tonight is because of God's grace and mercy. Amen. And I think prayer <coughs> keeps us strong. Over in Ephesians, and again, we won't turn there. I'll just close to this. There's so many verses we can turn to. But in Ephesians, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. When he goes through the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and the above all is the shield of faith, and then after he puts all that together, he says, you better pray. You better pray. Righteousness, your breastplate, the word of God, your sword, faith, your shield, the helmet of salvation. And then you've got to be people of prayer. And nobody knows about anybody else's prayer life. But I know this we need to pray. Our church needs to become a people of prayer. That's right. And I wish we had tons more people at our prayer meetings. But I'd give up our prayer meetings if I knew we prayed privately. We need to pray. Shut off the TV and pray. Take time to get up in the morning and pray. If you're up too early, if you have to get up at 4 in the morning, don't get up in the morning and pray. You're just going to sleep anyway. Pray at noon time. Pray in the evening. You that are getting older, you don't get out as much. Become a prayer warrior for those who are serving God. Pray. You, know, you look in the Bible. Paul closes several of the books. Brother, pray for us. Pray for us. If a man like the Apostle Paul said, pray for us, I would like to say to you, pray for me. Let's pray. pray for our college students. Pray for these young men starting churches. Pray. Pray for our missionaries. Every week, so we have these missionaries in the bulletin. Don't forget our mission. Pray for them individually. Pray for their children by name. Pray. Let's pray. Father, bless us tonight. So much more we can say and maybe 